Hello, I'm Anita Pritchard with the South Carolina Forestry Commission. Uh, my office is out of Orangeburg, and I'm the Santee Unit Forester. The beginning of the forest life cycle is the cutover, when the mature trees have been harvested and there's nothing left but the remaining wood debris and the new vegetation. We need to think of a cutover as a new beginning. Once we have a cutover, we want to think about what do we want to do with our stand? If we're looking at having pines become our next forest stand, there's what we call artificial regeneration, which is planting, and then there's also natural regeneration. If you decide to do natural regeneration, there's some things you need to consider down the road. One would be pre-commercial thinning. In a natural stand, if you have adequate regeneration naturally, usually you've got too much. You can have two, three, four thousand seedlings per acre, which is way too many. When the stand reaches around four years old, then you want to consider doing what we call a pre-commercial thin. You don't want to do it before then because in loblolly pine, loblollies can re-sprout in ages below four years old. If you decide that you don't want to do that and you're just going to let it start thinning itself naturally, you'll have a stand similar to the one behind me, or you could. And what you'll find is a lot of very skinny, small trees. You know, the land can only support what the land can support. You want the land to invest in your better quality trees or your better trees and in fewer trees. This situation is not good. These trees are gonna grow tall and skinny. They'll be suppressed and they won't reach their maximum potential. Generally, we recommend that you want to plant your stand because when you plant your stand, you know the the genetics of the trees that you're planting, so they're gonna be genetically superior to natural seedlings. And you can also control the spacing. Usually you wanna look for a spacing that goes from 500 to around 600, a little over 600 trees per acre. The reason we have the spacing is because we want trees close enough together to where they will grow tall instead of out. But we also want the on the spacing where the trees are beside each other, they will start crowding each other. And what that does over time is it starts to delimb the trees. Um, when we have a tree that's grown in the open, it produces limbs all the way to the ground. Those limb scars on the bole of the tree creates knots and that degrades the quality of the wood. Um, another thing we want to consider when we have a cut over is what are we going to plant? How do we decide what we want to plant? If we're deciding we want to plant a pine species, then the question comes, what kind of pine species do we plant? A lot of that has to do with site factors. The main two types of pines that we plant are in South Carolina is generally either a loblolly pine or a longleaf pine. In order to decide if, if my site's the type of site that I would want to plant a longleaf pine, we'll look at the soil. We'll look at the type of vegetation that's growing um, on the site. That's our site indicators to let us know which type of pine to plant. On a longleaf site, some of the site indicators would be reindeer moss, cactus, sparkleberry, scrub oaks, species of that nature that tend to be on a deeper sand site. Longleaf tend to do better actually in poor sites, but they can be planted in a variety of different areas. When we're deciding to choose a loblolly site, if loblolly will grow there well, then loblolly can be planted there. The only places that generally loblolly don't grow well are in deep, deep sands. The first thing you want to do before we actually plant the trees, if you're doing, um, if you're going to plant trees, is we want to think about site preparation. Generally, there's two types of site preparation. There's what we call chemical site preparation, and there's mechanical site preparation. This stand we're in now was chemically site prepared. And what it will do is you can have it either sprayed by hand or you can have it sprayed with a skitter, or helicopters can come and spray the chemicals. Usually when we do a chemical site preparation, we're looking at um, summertime 
in, er, in early fall, before the leaves fall off the trees. Generally, your competition to pines are gonna be other natural pines, um, any hardwood species, and some waxy species such as wax myrtles. What you wanna do too, when you're doing thinking about chemical um, site preparation, first of all, you want to contact a licensed chemical um, herbicide applicator to make the recommendation of what they, that you should have sprayed. Different species require different types of mixes and different types of chemicals to make sure you get adequate control. Cheaper is not always better. One thing you wanna think about too when we're talking about chemical site prep is when do I spray? Generally, a rule of thumb that I tell landowners is if you clear cut prior to March in a given year, then you will have adequate sprouting by September, October to spray. If you harvest your timber after March, you may not have enough sprouting to, to that where you want to spray. You may ask yourself, where does all this come from? Well, some of it comes from seeds, but some of it also comes from the stumps that were cut. We call that coppice. So we want to make sure that there's plenty of time for the, the sprouting to occur off the stumps, for the seeds to germinate and to come up so that we can make sure when we do do our chemical site preparation that we are um, eliminating all the competition from for the, our planted pines. This is a good site to demonstrate a chemical site prep. Um, this site was probably sprayed less than eight weeks ago. Um, what you can tell with this sweet gum right here is, is these leaves, they're starting to curl. That's a sign of the chemical starting to work. And what will happen is, um, as that chemical works within the leaves, it'll work its way through, that, through the stem and down into the root system and eventually kill the, tr the whole tree altogether. This process takes about eight weeks to do. So therefore too, if you're going to do a, a site prep burn after a chemical um, application, then you'll need to wait that eight weeks or, um, so that the chemical has time to work its way through the whole plant because any kind of mechanical disturbance or fire can set back the effectiveness of the chemical application. A lot of times too, you may hear people say that controlling natural pine is very difficult. Herbicides have gotten better over the years and they have become very successful in learning to control natural pine as well as the hardwood. So that is possible and it's worthwhile because even though they may be the same species, you may have natural loblolly and planted loblolly, you don't want the natural loblolly competing against the trees that you actually paid money for to plant. The second type of um, site preparation is mechanical site preparation. Before chemical became so successful, a lot of stands were strictly mechanically site prep. We usually have three different types of mechanical site preparation, what we call a one pass, two pass, and a three pass. One pass, we may use a drum chopper. As it rolls across the cutover, it'll knock down existing vegetation. It is a good form of, of site preparation if you don't want to use chem chemical in controlling um, natural pine competition, drum chopping will knock it over and, and it will take care of the natural pine competition. However, with hardwoods such as sweet gum, whenever you do um, use a drum chopper on sweet gum, you may knock down one, but that's gonna aggravate the root system. You're gonna have 10 more. Drum chopping is not a good control, for, especially for certain species of hardwood. The second type is what we call shear and rake. A bulldozer would come and knock down those trees and then they would pile them either in piles scattered across the stand or in wind rows, which would be rows of piled debris that would stretch from one end of the stand to the other. If you do choose to do this type of site preparation, you want to make sure that one, um, that the wind rows, the long rows, are on the contour to protect the soil from erosion. One thing you need to make sure too is if you, your operators, when they do this, they don't want to carry a lot of your topsoil into those wind rows because you want to keep the topsoil in place so that rich soil will be there to grow your planted pines. The third type of um, mechanical site prep is what we call a three pass. And 
that would be like the shear and the rake, but then also putting it into beds. And these are used in areas where the soil is very wet. You can put them in beds and so they'll be up above the water level and the trees have the opportunity to survive. Now, one thing I do wanna say here, you cannot, in a wet area, you cannot um, just decide to plant pines. Um, and you cannot just decide, decide to bed because wetlands and hydric soils are protected by the Corps of Engineers. So in order for a stand to be bedded and planted in pine, there has to be a presence of pine there in the past. A good rule of thumb, if there wasn't a presence of 50% trees, pine trees there in the past, then you will probably just wanna keep it a hardwood or a mixed hardwood pine stand bedding would not be appropriate. This stand that we're in right now is a good example of a one-year-old pine stand. This site was chemically site prepared and chemicals have done a good job of holding back the um, competition um, so that this seedling has had a good full year free of competition and that's what you really want to look for. Now we're in a three-year-old stand and this is what the trees will look like in a couple of years after the stand that we just previously looked at. As you can see, the chemicals are still working to help control competition. If you look in the uh, underneath the trees, there's grasses and still um, small vegetation that's growing that's providing browse and also providing good cover for small animals. We're standing here on an approximately two-year-old cutover. This is a perfect example of what happens when you do nothing. If your objective is for timber production, this site is not what you want. When you do nothing, you have scattered pine, both some longleaf, some wobbly, and open, which would generally produce a limmy pine tree. This stand behind me is a stand that was planted and, and there was no site, chemical site prep or mechanical site prep done to it. It was just, just planted and planted quickly after um, the harvest was done. What you'd notice is that the, the height of the pine trees and the height of the hardwoods are about the same, so they're competing. One thing you can do to um, help in this situation is you can do what we call a release. Have herbicide applicators come in and spray for, to kill the hardwoods. The reason I prefer to do a, a chemical site prep at the beginning before the trees are planted is because you can put a heavier rates of chemicals as opposed to a release situation. Um, so you're gonna use less chemicals in a release situation and you're not gonna get as effective kill but it will set them back and allow the pines to grow and overtop the hardwoods. A couple of things that you wanna consider when you're talking about thinning is the size of the trees. You also want to look at the crown closure, but you also want to look at the percentage of tree that is crowned. Typically, rule of thumb, we look at anywhere from 12 to 15 years um, after a stand, has, a stand has been established before it's ready to thin. But some factors that you wanna consider before thinning um, is height. Usually it's around anywhere between 40 and 50 feet when a logger is ready to do that. The second thing you wanna look at is diameter. Um, you want to have like six to eight inches of diameter before you thin. We talk about basal area and we have this little instrument we call a prism and it adds up what the basal area is and tells you how many square feet there are that tree per acre. When basal areas get to uh, around 120 square feet, then you want to consider thinning. A good rule of thumb too is how much do I thin? How much do I take out? And usually you will remove about a third on your first thinning. You know, some people, depending on your objectives, want a um, less crowded, less dense stand. I generally recommend to people on that first one, stick with the third, unless you are, have a very, very dense stand. If you're getting into the 140s, 160 square foot range, you, you may wanna go to half, but definitely not over that. And the reason for that is, is if you thin too heavily, 
when they get too much open area, when we have storms, they tend to get more damage. What you'll do is if you choose to do a second thinning, you may want to do that one a little bit heavier if you're trying to get to something like quail woods. A couple other things to consider is live crown ratio. And what live crown ratio is, is the amount of crown you have. And the crown of the tree is the green part of the tree where the leaves are. So you want about a 30% live crown ratio before you thin. If you wait too long, to thin on that live crown ratio, then when, when the tree gets less than 30% crown, then it doesn't have as many leaves to photosynthesize and produce the energy it needs to put, um, to put more wood on the tree. Another thing too is crown closure. And this is an easy one to spot. If you walk in the woods on a sunny day, when the crown closes in, the limbs are gonna overlap each other. And if you look on the ground, you're not gonna see much sunlight, even on, when, like I said, on a sunny day. When that happens, when you walk into a stand and it's pretty dark and shaded in there, it's time to thin. A lot of you may say, Anita, when do I know when it's time for a final harvest? the end of the, of the life cycle for our forest. Well, there's a lots of different, different factors that go in deciding when am I going to do a final harvest? And it really all boils down to your objectives. If your objectives are strictly financial, that will have one set of parameters. If, you're, um, if it's a wildlife is your main objective, that's gonna have a different set of parameters. The number one thing is to make sure you have a healthy stand. I would not allow economic or any other reasons to affect when I harvest. Um, I would allow economic factors to weigh in on the decision of when to harvest, but I'd also make sure I wasn't sacrificing the health of my trees and the health of my forest for that economic return. Um, usually though, a saying you're looking at around 35 years or so when you're looking at a final harvest.